If you want to open up to Second Kings six, thank you. So why you do that? I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Tommy kind of already said a little bit. Um, my name is Hudson Dismukes. I am in tenth grade and I'm homeschooled. Um, I've been a Christian for about ten, uh, sorry, eight years now, and I've been a member for about a year at this church. I became a Christian when I was seven years old um, in Tennessee, and my one of those the influence, I guess influencers, was my grandmother. Um, she was a strong Christian and prayer warrior, but when she died a few years back, uh, so I wanted to become more like her, and so I read and studied different parts of the book. And, but it, so every so often I need someone or something to help me refocus back on God. So when Mr. Tommy uh, asked me to preach for Youth Led Sunday, um, refocusing on God was one of the first things that came into my mind. So this is about refocusing on God. But to start off, I'm going to open us in prayer. God, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for um, this just warm weather, I guess, some people would like. Um, please make my words true and what you want me to say. If you don't want me to say something, just take it out of my mouth uh, so that I may not mislead uh, people from you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I love history. I love finding the origins from my family to um, U.S. to world history. For example, my grandfather was, on, it was in Vietnam War. My great-grandfather fought... Um, in World War II against Mussolini. And my great-grandmother and my great-grandmother both knew and were taught by Christy Huddleston in Tennessee. Um, and recently, I uh, found out that um, Henry Hudson is my 10th great-grandfather. And like I said, I love history. Kings, and King Solomon was right when he said that nothing is new under the sun. God loves us, and through his uh, grace, he constantly forgives and restores our relationship with him. But over time, we turn our focus away from him and um, his dependent, and we're uh, in our dependence on him, and rest on our own understandings and abilities. But because we turn away from him, he takes his hedge of protection from us. And we're destroyed, scattered, and spiritually lost. Psalms uh, seventy-nine, six. Or sorry, seventy-nine, one through ten, says, "O oh God, the nations have invaded your land." They have dishonored your holy temple. They have, they have left Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the dead bodies of your servants to the birds for food. They have given the flesh of your godly ones to the animals. They have shed the blood of your people around Jerusalem as if it was water. There is no one to bury your people. They have, they have become a great disgrace to our neighbors, an object of ridicule and, to, uh, and contentment to those around us. How long, O oh Lord, will, re will you remain angry forever? Will you... Um, will your fury continue to burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do, no, do not know you, on the kingdoms that have not called you. They have devoured Jacob, and they have destroyed his home. Do not uh, hold the crimes against, um, of our ancestors against us, because we, um, sorry, reach out to us soon with your compassion, because we are hopeless. Help us, O Lord, our Savior, for the glory of your name. Rescue us, and forgive our sins for the honor of your name. Why should the nations be allowed to say, where is their God? Let us watch as the nations learn that there is punishment for the shedding of our blood of our servants, of your servants. So now we'll turn back to 2 Kings 6. And then um, 2 Kings 6, 8 through 23. Okay. Um, whenever the king of Arab was fighting against Israel... And so I'm on, sorry, verse 8. Whenever the king of Aram was fighting against Israel, he asked for advice for his, uh, from his officers about where they could camp. So the man of God was sent a message to the king of Israel. Be careful not to go to that place. The Arameans are hiding there. Then the king of Israel would send somebody to that place of the man of God told him about. Elijah warned them so that they would be on their guard, and he did this repeatedly. The king of Aram was very angry about this. He called his officers and asked them, why won't you tell me who one of us, which one of us is a spy for the king of Israel? One of the officers says, no one, your majesty. Elijah, the prophet um, in Israel, tells the king everything you say, even in your own bedroom. The king said, find out where he is, then I will send my men to capture him. 
The king was told, he's in Dotham. So the king sent horses and chariots and a large fighting unit there. Then at night, and they came at night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up in the next morning, he went outside. He saw the troops, horses, and chariots surrounding the city. Elijah's servant asked, Master, what shall we do? Elijah answered, Don't be afraid. We have more forces on our side than they have on theirs. Then Elijah prayed, Lord, please open his eyes so that he may see. The Lord opened the eyes of the servant and let him see. The mountains around Elijah was full of fury and horses and chariots. So I'm going to stop right there on verse 18. My little sister, when I was reading this, pointed out that it's Elijah's servants, kind of like, or like the, the God's angels, kind of like this book. Um, for this book, you had to cross your eyes really weird and like, to, and then like zoom in and out to see the pictures. For some people, it's just some random kid drawing kind of thing where it's just people. But if you look closely and cross your eyes just enough, you can see what the true picture is. Elijah's servant is just like this, or we are just like this also. Some people can feel and not necessarily see, but see God's angels around them, while other people kind of struggle with that, and other people don't even see it at all. Like, my little sister, she can't see any of these pictures, which is kind of funny. But, I t and it's just, and how Elijah, he can see every single one of these er, pictures, but also angels, how, and God made that right time, at that right moment, for Elijah to open his eyes of his servants. So we kind of need to open our eyes to what God has for us. So I'm resuming at uh, verse 18. As the Arameans came down to get him, Elisha prayed uh, to the Lord, please strike these people with blindness. The Lord struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this isn't the way, this isn't the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you're looking for. So he led them to Samaria. When they came to Samaria, Elijah uh, said, Lord, open the eyes of these servants and I will let them see and let them see. The Lord opened their eyes and let them see that they're in the middle of Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked, Elijah, master, can I, um, uh, should I kill them? Should I kill them? Uh, Elijah, I'm sorry, Elijah <laughs> answered, do not kill them. Do not kill, do you kill every one of you, every person you take captive? Give them food and water, let them drink, then let them go back to their master. So the king prepared a great feast for them. They ate and drank, and then he sent them back to their master. After this, the Aramean troops didn't raise, raid Air, Israel's territory anymore. So during this time, Israel was at war with the Aramean, or Armadons, or Aramians, depending on what people say. Uh, but Elijah completely trusted in God, while his servant did not. Elijah asked God to open his eyes of his servant so that he can see God's protection. I sometimes think that this country... Uh, was, uh, sorry, I, um, I, I think we've totally forgotten that this country was founded and formed by the grace and master plan of God. Countless stories are found about the pilgrims, the founding fathers, and people, and different people that trusted in God and believe that this nation will not perish if we have God as the leader of this, na of this great nation. Years before the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, Squanto had, uh, God had a plan for Squanto. Years before, Squanto was kidnapped by Europeans. And from that, he became fluent in English. He also received medicine that av and avoided diseases that killed a large part of his um, tribes, or his family tribe. He was then able to go back to the New World and help the pilgrims during the rough times. Then during the Revolutionary War, God showed his hand of protection many times. George Washington, George Washington who prayed every day before every battle and led scriptural readings um, with his soldiers, had four bullets shot through his coat and two horses shot from out underneath him and still lived. In August 1776, Washington and his troops were fearing an attack from the British, but God was looking out for the Americans. On August 28, 19, uh, 1776, there's a freezing rain that, that, prevent, that prevented the British from climbing the city's hill and taking over. Washington took this opportunity and started to evacuate the city. As night fell, the freezing rain slowed but the only problem was that once the sun rose, uh, yeah, once the sun rose, the last 8,000 troops from the Americans would be able to see, um, was, would be in sight for the British uh, troops and ships. But God was looking out for them again. He sent a dense fog to hide the British troops, for, sorry, to hide the troops from the British. What was even more amazing, that the locals said that the fog was abnormal during that time of year. Um, during this time, 
even the British were saying that the fog was sent from a divine power. After the war, George Washington said, I was but a humble agent of a favoring heaven whose benign influence was so often manifested in our behalf and to whom the praise of victory alone is due. He saw that the hand of God was over the new nation. During the Gettysburg Address, which is only two minutes long, Abraham Lincoln said, this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Even during this great civil war, as he said earlier in the passage, in the address, he believed that if we are a nation under God, then we will not fall. Like Elijah's servant, we may think that we are not blind to God or his plans, but we are. God has yours and my life in his hands, and he knows what's happening to us. He even knows how many hairs are on top of your head. And like the soldiers, God can take off the blindness that we have, and so is his grace. In conclusion, like Elijah did, we as a nation need to put our entire trust and faith in God. But if we don't, if we do not, like it says in Psalm 79, 6, God will pour out his wrath on us. I'm going to leave you with one question. Are you we in love with, are we focused on God's love or are we just focused on what God can give us? What I mean by this is we should focus on God's love and for who he is, not for what he can give us. So, are you in love with God or, who we, uh, or his blessings? I'm going to pray, but before I do that, there's going to be some men and a song, and so if you want to pray, you can just come up and um, pray at the altar. Uh, let's pray.